My name is Melissa Nobles, and I'm the Kina Sahin Dean of the MIT School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, or SHAS, as we call it, and a professor of political science in the school. It is my privilege to welcome you to the 2021 Robert A. Mew Alumni Award Ceremony and Lecture honoring the Right Honorable David W. Miliband. The Robert A. Mew Award was established in the year 2000 on the 50th anniversary of the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. Bob Mew, MIT class of 1959, created the award to honor MIT graduates who have gone on to make major contributions to education, scholarship, performance, academic leadership, and administration in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. The Mew Award has proven to be an exceptional way to highlight MIT's excellence and world-class world -class excellence in these disciplines. Bob Mew, a co-founder of the Sutter Securities Incorporated in San Francisco, has served on several SHAS visiting committees and is a life member emeritus of the MIT Corporation. Bob inspires all of us with his dedication to MIT, and we are grateful for his deep commitment to his alma mater. Bob and his wife, Barrett, are, are here with us today, along with their daughters, Allison and Carrie, who is also a 1996 graduate of the Institute. Bob, Barrett, we thank you for making the Mew Award possible, and we are delighted that you and your family could join us on this wonderful occasion. Uh, Bob and Barrett, may I ask you to share a few remarks on what this award means to you? Uh, thank you, Melissa. Uh, when I hear you cite the fact that I graduated in 1959, it makes me feel old. But I have to tell you, it was serving as a member of the corporation that I had the opportunity to serve in a number of MIT's visiting committees, uh, including several in Shas. Right. And even though we were all aware of the excellence of MIT in science and engineering, serving on those visiting committees showed me the unbelievable selective excellence MIT has in the true humanities and arts. Uh, it was that that led us to want to create this, this award. Uh, this will be the ninth award uh, in this field. And the people who have received it in the past have been world-class artists, uh, highest levels of government, and as we're going to hear today, very significant people in the world, uh, in the nonprofit world. So I really thank everyone for joining us. Melissa, it's back to you. Great. Thank you. I wonder, Barrett, do you have some remarks you'd like to make? Um, only that I'm I'm always amazed at how strong the humanities and social sciences are at MIT, how many students take them and their appreciation of them other than just in the pure science areas and engineering. So we're really thrilled with having to be able to be involved with this award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob and Barrett. Uh, and again, I wanna thank you again for uh, very much appreciate your vision for making events like this possible. And I wanna thank all of our guests for joining us here today, including Diane Green, the chair of the MIT Corporation. So today we recognize the Right Honorable David W. Miliband, who received a master's degree in political science in 1990. To introduce Mr. Miliband and, and uh, to uh, share his accomplishments, I'm pleased uh, to welcome my colleague, uh, Professor Richard Samuels. He's the Ford International Professor of Political Science and director of MIT's Center of International Studies, or CIS as we call it. Following Dick's introduction, I will present the Mew Award and then we will hear Mr. Miliband's lecture. Dick? Thanks, thanks very much, Melissa. It, it is a great pleasure to welcome the Right Honorable David Wright Miliband back to MIT and to introduce him to you this afternoon. Now I've emphasized his middle name and I'll have more to say about that in a moment, but First, as most of you are, are well aware, uh, David is the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. And in this capacity, he oversees the agency's relief and development operations in over 30 countries. He oversees its refugee resettlement and assistance programs throughout the United States and the IRC's advocacy efforts in Washington and other capitals on behalf of the world's most vulnerable people. 
Now, before taking up this post in 2013, David was a Labour Party MP, and in 2007, at the ripe young age of 41, he became the UK's Foreign Secretary, one of the youngest in history. Now, this too is likely well known to you all here today, but less well known uh, to those of you who are not political scientists or economists of a certain generation or two, like me and my much, much younger colleagues, Dean Nobles and Daron Asimoglu. Less well known may be his intellectual pedigree. Those of us who studied in the 1970s and the 1980s encountered the important work of David's father, the new left sociologist, Ralph Miliband. And we also encountered the important work of one of his father's closest friends, C. Wright Mills, probably the most important mid-century mid -century analyst of the American elite, and the man to whom David owes his middle name. Now, New Yorker readers who are interested may want to pull out last month's March 22nd issue to read just how influential the ideas of David's father and C. Wright Mills were for leaders of the anti-war movement here in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s. Now, we can welcome David back uh, because after taking his first class honors degree in, in Oxford's highly regarded philosophy, politics, and economics program, he was named a Kennedy Scholar. And uh, as Melissa said, he came to the MIT Department of Political Science where he earned a master's degree. And in the same vein uh, of sort of taking ownership of his accomplishments where we neither earn the right to do so nor deserve to exercise it, uh, David returned to MIT in, in 2011 as a short-term Robert E. Wilhelm Fellow in residence at the Center for International Studies. And we were delighted at the time to get to know his wife, Louise Shackleton, and their sons, Jacob and Isaac. Now, while at MIT, he delivered a major public talk on the war in Afghanistan and met with faculty and students across the Institute who shared his interest in international affairs and global issues. And in this regard, David was well ahead of most senior government officials on both sides of the Atlantic. He served as environmental secretary in Prime Minister Tony Blair's government and has long been an outspoken advocate for international awareness of climate change and global cooperation to achieve environmental reform. These issues, and in particular their repercussions, including refugee and agricultural crises are at the core of his work at the International Rescue Committee, which oversees humanitarian aid and the development programs across the, across the globe. His accomplishments have earned him a reputation in former Bill Clinton's words, uh, former President Bill Clinton's words, as one of the ablest, most creative public servants of our time. In 2016, David was named one of the world's greatest leaders by Fortune Magazine, and in 2018, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. David's also the author of the book, Rescue, Refugees and the Political Crisis of Our Time. Now, this is important uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of which is that he's the son of refugees, and he brings a personal commitment to the IRC's work and to the premise of the book, which is, that we can rescue the dignity and the hopes of refugees and displaced people, and that if we help them in the process, we will also rescue our own values. So it's entirely proper that he's here with us today to receive the ninth biennial Robert A. Mew Alumni Award that honors an MIT graduate for noteworthy achievements in the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences. Indeed, I, I should say it's more than proper. It's truly our honor. Uh, that he's here today to receive this award. So David, again, welcome back. And we all look forward to your remarks. Back Dick, to you, thank please. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Dick. That was that was really such a fulsome and 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 uh, illustrative introduction and, and, and really uh, fills out fully why David is indeed properly the recipient of the Mew Awards. Um, so I'm going to present it to you now, David. Now ordinarily in, in, in the days before the before the, the pandemic, you would be here with us at MIT. We would be in a grand hall, getting ready to hear your lecture and then getting ready for a great dinner. But alas, 
we are still living in virtual world. And so therefore we'll do the best that we can, but whether in person or online, it is my pleasure to share this award with you and with our audience. So the inscription reads, the Robert A. Mew Alumni Award in the Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, presented to the Right Honorable David W. Miliband, Political Science 90, Distinguished Public Servant and Humanitarian, April 28th, 2021, School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you so much, David. And it's my pleasure. We're going to send this to you. We we'll mail it to you. And we hope that you will have it and, and honor it and, rem and remind you of, of your, your time at MIT. And also, it conveys our great uh, respect for your work and, uh, and, and celebration of your accomplishments. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nobles. Uh, your, your tributes and that of uh, Professor Samuels, Dick Samuels, really were fulsome and uh, way beyond what I deserve. And so I really feel um, an enormous sense of modesty in uh, coming to you today. I'm speaking to you from my wife's uh, study on the Upper West Side of New York because the International Rescue Committee is living virtually just like uh, we are all living virtually. So I am sorry not to be with you in person uh, but I'm truly honored by the uh, decision to uh, give me the uh, 2021 Mew Award. I'm really delighted that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mew and their daughters are with us today. That's very meaningful. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. I, I really want to thank uh, you all for being willing to sit through a 25 minute lecture. And also those of us, those of the audience uh, from uh, actually around the world, I've uh, discovered people are tuning in. So really thank you for your patience and for your interest and I'm very much uh, hoping that in the discussion that we have from about uh, 1235 or so onwards we can explore some of the questions I raise and uh, challenge some of the answers I give and maybe even uh, improve upon them. But I'm really uh, thrilled uh, to be here and uh, very very grateful and thank you Dick for the terribly nice um, and thoughtful words that you that you, that you offered. C. Wright Mills wrote an extraordinary book called The Sociological Imagination. And the last paragraph of The sociolog Sociological Imagination has an injunction to combine personal um, ambition with public issues. I haven't quite got quite the right uh, wording, but it's one of the most beautiful injunctions for anyone uh, involved in um, the social sciences. But C. Wright Mills's point is that it's an injunction for all of us as citizens, not just for those for those who are professional social scientists. And I hope today I can speak both to uh, public issues and to personal interests in my talk. The bookends for the talk are the changed geopolitical environment since I was a graduate student at MIT in 1988-89. I completed my master's thesis in the summer of 1989 and vividly remember watching on TV the scenes in Tiananmen Square as I house sat in a leafy professor's house in Belmont, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, few of us had the sense that the post-war Cold War order, with the post, the post Second World War, the Cold War order was about to be turned upside down by the fall of the Berlin Wall less than six months later. The idea of the quote unquote end of history was only just getting into academic articles. Certainly that there was no sense that we were about to enter weeks in which decades happen. I think that's a quote from, I can't quite remember who said that, but they, the, the, the quote, maybe it was Lenin actually, who said that there are uh, decades when nothing happens and then there are weeks when decades happen. And the end of 1989 certainly felt uh, like that kind of time. Uh, this era, uh, at the end, of the, the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s became the era of the third wave of democracy, so-called because the number of countries in the world democratizing tripled from 25 to 75 in the span of a decade. From Eastern Europe to, South, to Southern Africa, to Latin America, to the Far East, the tools of authoritarian rule didn't seem to work anymore. A new future was quite suddenly in view, perhaps too suddenly for the kind of clear thought that is necessary. Not the end of arguments about the good society, not the end of protest about equality or governance or foreign policy, not sadly the end of wars based on ethnicity or religion. After all, the 1990s were the decade of the Rwandan genocide. But that was a period when there emerged an arguable case 
that political history had a settled destination, reached at different speeds in systems based on a combination of accountable government, human rights, and political democracy. In this telling, the Cold War had two sides. One was democratic, the other was autocratic. The democratic side won, and history would bring more victories for democratic governance. That is one at bookend for my talk today. The other is the present day, and it provides a stark contrast. Not the third wave of democracy, but what scholars at the University of Gothenburg call the third wave of autocratization. Not a great word, a rather difficult word to get out. But across the world, democratic systems based on fair elections and the rule of law are not advancing, they're in retreat. And, the third, and that's what the third wave of autocratization means. Here's what the scholars in Gothenburg are talking about. According to the Economist Intelligence Unit, 70% of the world's countries saw a reduction in political freedom last year. Autocratic regimes now outweigh the gross domestic product of the democratic West for the first time in 100 years. The number of countries ranked as full democracies is down to 32 in the world. And 68% of the world's population are living under autocratic rule, a 20 point jump in just a decade. And finally, only 14% of the global population, according to that Varieties of Democracy project, and 8%, if you believe the Economist Intelligence Unit, live in fully democratic systems. The population living under autocratic rule is more than four times higher. Professor Larry Diamond of Stanford University says all types of regime are becoming less liberal. In other words, they are giving less privilege to political freedom. Whether you're a democracy or an autocracy, you're becoming less liberal, according to Professor Diamond. And the data from Gothenburg put numbers on this. In the past decade, 10 countries have moved from liberal democracies to electoral democracies. In other words, they have the formalities of electoral democratic politics, but they are not fair and equal in the way democracy works. Poland is an example, a tragic example in some ways, of a democracy where the ruling party has consolidated and often abused power. 13 countries have moved from democratic ranking to electoral autocracies. In other words, one person or one party rule. This includes India, which was previously the world's largest democracy. And five autocratic regimes have moved into the most harsh category of the four, closed autocracy. What's happening in China fits that category. Now, two academics, James Robinson and MIT's Darren Ashimolu, have explained in their brilliant book, The Narrow Corridor, why this shouldn't be a surprise. They say there's nothing, quote unquote, natural about liberal democracy. If anything, it's an unnatural creation and one that takes perpetual nurture if it's to endure. It's a fragile plant and it needs to be protected and nurtured. And I'll come back to uh, the professors and their book later in my talk. Today, I want to apply a particular lens to the story I've told you about the trajectory of the last 30 years. It's a link to developments in foreign affairs. Here's the lens I want to apply to the story that I've just told you. It's, the lens is the idea of impunity. It's traditionally been a legal term, but I want to use it as a tool of policy and political analysis. As many of you will know, impunity means the absence of consequence for an action. And in the case of an illegal action, it means the absence of punishment for that illegal action. In more colloquial terminology, impunity is the exercise of power without responsibility, what the British Prime Minister in the 1930s, Stanley Baldwin, called the refuge of the harlot throughout the ages. Now, I'm going to make three claims to you today. First, that there is growing a growing age of impunity that is the international or foreign relations counterpart of the democratic recession that I've described happening in countries around the world. Systems and cultures of impunity are leading to more acts of impunity. Second, I'm gonna argue or claim that international impunity is on the rise in international conflicts around the world where the International Rescue Committee works because of a shift in power against the aspirations of the rules-based international order that was established in name but not always in practice after 1945. I'm gonna highlight two elements of this international impunity and its rise. 
One is that autocratic regimes are stronger and insist that what happens within a country is only the responsibility of that state. The second point is that they've found unexpected bed bedfellows in this assertion of national sovereignty and against the assertion of, individ of individual and universal rights in democratic states that are in retreat, turning inward, reasserting national sovereignty as well as domestic focus themselves and reeling from foreign policy failures. That's certainly my reading of what's happening in the UK and in the US. The third claim I'm gonna make, or has happened, the third claim I'm gonna make is that to fight against international impunity, we do not need new ideas about the laws of war or the rights of individuals. The ideas in the United Nations Charter and associated documents are good ideas. What we need is a defining idea for how to defend them, a focus on some key issues, and the mobilization of the assets of government, private sector, and civil society to do so. Since power has shifted against the defense of universal rights, a reversal of this trend depends on more than quoting laws to men with swords. It requires countervailing power to change their calculus. So that's the argument I'm gonna make. Here's claim one, or the facts to back it up, the rise in international impunity. When a coach of children is bombed in Yemen, when health facilities are bombed in Syria, when Syri civilians are denied humanitarian aid in Ethiopia or Nigeria, or aid workers are killed in those countries, we are seeing impunity because there is and has been no consequence or punishment for those actions. At best, there is a bit of international pleading for the killing to stop. The data on this is striking and horrifying. Civilians are now 70% of the victims in the modern conflict around the world today. An average of 34,000 civilians are killed in conflict each year, more than double the average five years ago, seven times the average in 2008. Equally, more civilians are fleeing conflict, a record 80 million refugees and displaced people around the world. But not just the total numbers. Here's a very interesting statistic, I think. In conflicts, all conflicts since 1945, an average of five people were displaced as refugees for one person killed. Yet in the Syria war, which is the world's largest refugee crisis today, the ratio has been not five to one, but 25 to one. That speaks to the brutality of the conflict itself and the way it's affecting civilians. Just in parenthesis, there are more aid workers killed than before, 121 aid workers killed each year, including several of my own IRC colleagues, compared with an average of about half that level in 2004. There are more attacks on health facilities and far from abating during the global pandemic, attacks on health facilities have only worsened with more health workers and patients killed in 2020 than in 2019. Also, more children are living close to high intensity conflict, 160 million, according to the Save the Children charity. That's more than the number of children who live in the United States and Europe combined. There's more ethnic cleansing as well. The civil society group Genocide Watch lists 13 ongoing genocide emergencies where ethnic cleansing massacres are ongoing. These involve powerful countries, not just small rogue states. And there is a remarkable link between poverty and conflict. The geography of poverty is changing around the world today, so that nearly 50% of the world's extreme poor live in fragile and conflict states, and that percentage is growing every year. There are more extreme poor in Nigeria today than in India, even though the population of Nigeria is about one eighth the population of India. So, there's my first claim, that there is a clear trend of growing international lawlessness and, if you'll excuse, excuse the word, normlessness as well. Laws and norms are being broken. Interestingly enough, the latest national, US government National Intelligence Council report, Global Trends 2040, highlights the rule of law as one of the threatened norms of the global order. And this trend to lawlessness and normlessness has been enabled by what the Munich Security Conference calls Westlessness, the retreat of the West, part of the second claim to which I'm now going to turn. And I use the West not as a geographic term, but as a political term. The former German foreign minister, Joschka Fischer, talked about the Atlantic Charter, which was signed by Churchill and Roosevelt in Newfoundland in 1941, 
as the quote unquote birth certificate of the West. And what he was talking about was a birth certificate to a political project of open markets, but also of territorial of uh, independence for previously colonial uh, states and for universal rights. So the claim number two about the shift in the balance of power. The second claim is that this trend towards impunity is a symptom of a shift in the balance of power. Those ready to abuse international rules have less reason to fear that they'll get found out and held accountable. To repeat, there never was a golden age, but after the traumas of genocide in Rwanda in 1990s, the massacre in Srebrenica in the former Yugoslavia, there was a determined attempt to live up to the aspirations of the post-war settlement, culminating in the so-called responsibility to protect resolution of the United Nations in 2005. It promised that if nation states abuse the rights of their own citizens, then the international community had a responsibility to uphold them. That seems like another world today, because it is. That responsibility to protect is not being honored. The causes of the shift are multiple, but the essential dynamic is quite simple. There's less chance today that war crimes will be punished. And so of course, the confidence of combatants that war crimes will be unpunished is reinforced every time that happens and encourages more of it. What are the reasons? I just want to highlight three briefly. First, the changing nature of conflict, the shift towards urban warfare. That's why 70% of the victims of war today are civilians because of the shift towards urban conflict. The National Intelligence Council report that I referred to just a moment ago gives prominence to the Uppsala conflict data programs finding that the number of internationalized intrastate conflict, in other words, civil wars that have external backers has more or less quintupled in the last 15 to 20 years. And that has uh, combined with this urban nature of conflict. And I would conclude that, that point by saying that complexity and opacity have risen faster in war zones around the world than digital media have brought clarity and accountability. So the changing nature of conflict is the first reason for this shift in the balance of power. Second, geopolitics, obviously. I mean, Dick Samuels is a, a world expert on this. There is the emergence of a powerful alternative political system represented by China unfree in politics, but competitive in economics, which has challenged the Western model. Meanwhile, Russia has sought revenge for what it sees as the economic and political humiliations of the 1990s. And both countries vigilantly adhere to the doctrine that says what goes on within a state, even massacres, should be the business only of that state and not the business of anyone else. This has weakened the ability of the international system to enforce and uphold the basic pillars of the international order, including the Geneva Conventions. And the third reason for the trend is that the West is in political and intellectual retreat. Failures in foreign policy and economics have sapped the strength of populations in liberal democratic countries for international engagement and the sacrifice it involves. Meanwhile, the Chinese and Russian use of national sovereignty as a shield against calls for accountability has chimed with those nationalist populist movements within the liberal democratic world who have sought to make national sovereignty their calling card. So there's been a power shift. Secretary Blinken, Blinken your, the US Secretary of State said recently, quote, look at the countries that ride roughshod over the rights of their own people. They're almost always the same countries that flout internationally accepted rules beyond their own borders. Now, unquote. The whole point of the UN Charter and its associated founding documents was to mitigate against this tendency for dictatorship within a country to become the abuse of international rule of law. The UN Charter and its associated documents created rights for people against the overmighty power of the state and institutions with a mandate to defend those rights. Countries could choose their own political system, democracy or dictatorship, monarchy or republic, but they would sign on to international rules. And just as professors Robinson and Ajamoglu argue that at the national level, there is a constant day in day out struggle to walk the narrow corridor between fear and repression wrought by despotic states on the one hand and violence and lawlessness that emerges when there isn't a state. So I want to argue that international relations has a narrow corridor to walk through as well between the rights of individuals to be upheld 
against the important rights that also exist for states. Unless that balance is achieved, the result is despotism and impunity. And this takes us to my third claim, which is about the need for countervailing power to the power currently felt by those operating in war zones and willing to kill and break international law for their own ends. The third claim, in other words, is about the battle ahead for those of us who fear a world of impunity and what we can do to build accountability to counter the abuse of power. And I think this way of thinking about the challenge, promoting accountability, is more relevant and more hopeful than the previously described mission to build democracy. Of course, I want to see democracy strengthened, notably in countries that are democratic, but are seeing their democratic systems assailed. But democracy is the strongest form of political accountability. And you cannot have democracy, a campaign for democracy unless you have a campaign for accountability. And that's where I think we need to start. Now, in the title of the lecture, there was a reference to the idea of countervailing power. I think actually in the title, it was written up as countervailing powers, but I just want to, um, at this late stage, offer us a small correction. Because 70 years ago, J.K. Galbraith, John Kenneth Galbraith, published an important book. It was called American Capitalism, the Concept of Countervailing Power. Not countervailing powers, but countervailing power. It offered a powerful critique of the development of the American economy after the Second World War, notably the concentration of economic power at the corporate level, which he saw as a threat to the interests and well being of ordinary Americans. Galbraith's answer was not antitrust, although he didn't oppose that, but the development of market and non market institutions that could countervail the power of big corporates. Where there were big producers, he favored big retailers to take them on. Where there were corporate consortia, he favored countervailing power from government. Where there were unorganized workers, he favored labor unions, trade unions. As he put it, quote, liberalism will be identified with the buttressing of weak bargaining power in the economy. Conservatism will be identified with positions of original power. I want to suggest that we need to bring back to life Galbraith's concept of countervailing power today and apply it to the curb that on the abuse of state power that we're seeing at the international level. I'm glad that the Biden administration supports a meeting of liberal democracies to discuss how to defend the rule of law and democratic practice. But the big decision is not to have a meeting. The big decision is to decide the agenda. And I think the building of countervailing power should be that agenda. Yes, the defense of democratic institutions against cyber attack. Yes, a common front to tackle the laundering of money from autocratic states, common positions on the regulation of what should be called anti-social media, common positions on trade issues linked to human rights standards. But I also want to see them take common action to impose costs on those who abuse international law and thereby change the calculus of combatants on the battlefield. In fact, I would go further. I would say that if the rights to life of civilians in war zones cannot be defined, cannot be defended, I'm sorry, if the rights of, to life of civilians in war zones can't be defended, when they have been codified in international law, then we have less chance of defending other rights that are important, whether that be the rights of protesters against their government, or the rights of women against abuse by men, or the rights of minorities to freedom of religion, of freedom of religion, freedom of thought, or freedom of sexuality. So the idea that, that should animate the drive against impunity is that of countervailing power. The issues should include those of life and death. And the coalition that needs to be mustered should engage government, private sector, and civil society. And I just want to give a couple of examples. I'm slightly overrunning the time. But I want to just give a couple of practical examples uh, to bring that to life. None alone, government, or civil society or the private sector are gonna be able to achieve this alone. It needs a coalition. A world where accountability, not impunity is on the rise, needs pressure from all three sources. First, governments, notably in the West, but not only there, need to get their own house in order. No government can go and tackle impunity abroad if it's guilty of impunity at home. They need to, these governments in the West need to combine their weight in political fora to ensure that they apply peer pressure to each other, to ensure that they uphold the higher standards themselves, but then also apply political pressure to others for adherence to the laws of war. At the UN, 
They need to be calling for genuinely independent and comprehensive investigations of war crimes wherever they happen. I'm sad to report to you that that has not happened in Syria or in Yemen, where for reasons of realpolitik, UN investigations have been blocked. Governments need to be supporting efforts to use their own legal systems to hold people accountable. The German courts have recently used the principle of universal jurisdiction and the documentation from civil society groups to prosecute war criminals from Syria. That's right, that's important. It changes the calculus. Governments also need to use military to military contacts, military training, military coalitions of which they are a part against the drift of impunity in conflict. It saddens me, to put it mildly, that the UK and the US should have been supporters of the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen, which was guilty of the bombing raid on a coachload of 43 children that I referred to earlier. So government has an important role, but it also needs to engage the private sector. We've seen in the recent Georgia and Texas voting rights cases in the United States, the power of major corporates to take a stand. This should be the demand of those who engage with governments who flout the rule of international law. If you're a weapons manufacturer or a financier of weapons manufacturers who thinks it's wrong for your weapons to be used to target civilians, then you have a duty to speak up and act up. We know that money is often used to grease the wheels of impunity through corruption and patronage, but it can also be a force for accountability if channeled properly. This includes targeted economic sanctions, against individuals committing atrocities, such as freezing their bank accounts. It means divestment and suspension of aid by public and private actors. For example, it also includes the idea that insurance companies should decline to provide coverage for companies and countries engaged in activities that violate international humanitarian law. The drift to impunity will not be stopped without those with economic power taking a stand. And then there is a special responsibility on tech and media companies because control of the information space is absolutely critical to sustaining systems of impunity. In conflict zones around the world, effective news blackouts are the norm, not the exception. Breaking the blackout takes political pressure, but also requires technological innovation to make it safe for civilians to record what is happening and then get the information out. And then there is the vital role of pressure from civil society. Just one example, the New York Times and independent actors like Bellingcat and the Syrian Observatory of Human Rights have done more to expose abuse of international law in Syria than any UN commission. Civil society has a role to play too, and that should be an inspiration to expose and hold accountable those perpetrating the worst atrocities. Let me conclude in the following way with renewed apologies for the um, extra two or three uh, minutes and thanks for the uh, award. I said in the room beforehand that the great thing about being asked to, to give a public lecture is you have to really think about it. So I'm appreciative of the homework that you gave me. I, I believe that the next decade promises to be a race or a fight between accountability and impunity within our own countries, but also internationally, and the two are connected. It applies in politics, this contest between accountability and impunity, in economics, it even applies in respect of the environment where ecological plunder can be considered a form of impunity, albeit a long-standing one. It's impunity because the future and the planet have no votes in our elections. So we've got to mitigate the tendency for the rights of the future to be abused. Impunity in this fight with accountability offers quick solutions, but sometimes feels brittle. Accountability courts the accusation of being slow, but the methodic methodical tortoise sometimes beats the hyperactive hair. That's what we've got to work for. The quote unquote end of history was the Kool-Aid of the end of the Cold War. It was misdiagnosed, but the impulse that protested unsuccessfully at, Ten at Tiananmen Square, which I watched on TV, and successfully in East Berlin, where I was meant to be actually after leaving MIT, was strong and clear. It was the impulse simply put for power to be held accountable. The coming age of impunity is only inevitable if we let it be so. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. That was um, for your really um, insightful and deeply perceptive and, and most times bracing uh, talk. Um, in the time remaining, 
Uh, we have uh, questions and we've received some questions in advance from the attendees. And, uh, and I know Dick as moderator has some of his own. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dick. Thanks very much, Melissa and, and David, thank you. I, I, uh, I, uh, I wanna thank you for, it was just a wonderfully comprehensive and as Melissa said, insightful. She said bracing, I say depressing, but okay. Uh, review of our of our current situation. Um, in particular, I, I found your your identification of impunity and power shifts, and the need for institutional countervalence very compelling. Uh, in particular, countervalence, and that's where I want to start the questions because I'm sure many in the audience uh, found them compelling as well. Um, and in particular, there was a question that was raised uh, about countervalence from a member of the audience who asks. What actions could universities, what's the role of universities? What could we do individually or collectively uh, to serve as an effective countervailing power to illiberal forces at home and abroad? Well, that's, um, I think, a really, uh, really important uh, question. I wish I'd thought of answering it in my uh, talk. Uh, the, uh, here's the way I come to this. Um, uh, before I came to MIT, I was a student at Oxford. And my college, along with Balliol College, was the first uh, college to disinvest from South Africa in the mid middle of the 80s. So the first answer to how should universities play a role, they should use their money and not to put too fine a point on it. Institutions in American higher education have a hell of a lot of money. And the where they put their investments says a lot about the principles that they are willing to stand up for. And so first, what do you do with your assets? Uh, secondly, um, how do you uh, defend your scholars and your students when they are the victims of impunity? I think is a really important uh, set of issues that universities have to grapple with. And um, it's, a, it's a very complicated area as you, as you, know, uh, as you know well. Uh, thirdly, I think that, um, there's a danger that universities underestimate their voice together. We know the voice of people, when people talk about a public intellectual, they're thinking about individual scholars. But one of my reflections is that higher education doesn't have a loud enough voice in national and international affairs at an institutional level. And I want to suggest one reason why that is, I think it's an area where competition gets in the way. You very, I, I stand to be corrected, but I uh, don't hear much of the 10 or 30 or 50, quote unquote, top American universities speaking together about big issues. And I think it would be interesting to see them uh, do so. So I hope that um, the idea of countervailing power, I've, I've grasped onto the idea of countervailing power precisely because it's as, broad ranging as the idea of impunity that it's designed to counteract. And so I hope there are ways in which universities individually and collectively can be part of this um, recognition that there is a global trend underway that is dangerous and needs and, and, and enjoins responsibility from all of us um, personally as well as institutionally. Thank you. I Let's stick with this idea of countervalence for a bit and, and dig at it, scratch at it a bit more. Um, uh, I thought it came to, a, in, your, in your presentation, it came to a particularly sharp point uh, in your remarks when you identified what you called the special responsibility of tech and media companies to combat news blackouts. So we're going to transition from the, the responsibility of the university to the responsibility of tech and media companies. Um, it, it, when you mentioned that, you know, it, it, it raised a related question that's widely discussed these days. And it's one you alluded to when you talked about the roles and responsibilities of social media. I mean, their promise, of course, included social and political benefits from broader communication, greater transparency. But as we all know, um, they've been widely blamed for enabling the manipulation of information that's led to the loss of trust and the destruction of community in democratic states. And you indeed, you referred to that as the regulation of antisocial media, which I thought was lovely. So 
what kind of regulation do you have in mind and how can it be a countervailing power to something so powerful as social media has become? Yeah. So look, I, I want to get this, I think this is the right quotation from um, a scholar called Shoshana Zuboff. And she's got this phrase, which I think is brilliant, where she says the 20th century politics was about control of the means of production. And 21st century politics is about control of the production of meaning. It's, it's a really clever nice. point. You, you've got to have, I mean, she, she may be a professor, but she's also the, the master or mistress of the soundbite. I mean, that is really very, uh, uh, very powerful. So the production of meaning is, goes to the heart of this question of whether there are facts and alternative facts. And what social media didn't create or anti-social media didn't create, but which has um, uh, boosted is the idea that there can be facts and alternative facts. And uh, there's this hoary old uh, um, uh, phrase um, that um, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. I mean, the danger is that we're moving into a world where you're entitled to your own facts. And that is the death of democracy, really. If you haven't got an agreed set of facts on which people have different opinions and different judgments, that, then you're in very serious um, territory. And the fact that on my reading, the profit margins of the tech companies, some tech companies, are boosted by the fact that hate goes round at more velocity than love, more or less, that negative stories go round, are shared more than positive stories, tells you that you've got a really serious clash between the public interest and the profit motive. And that's what requires regulation. Now, I think there are three things that I think are important. One, um, these are publishing companies. Let's just be honest about what the social media, anti-social media are doing. They're publishing. Sometimes they're publishing my blog. Sometimes they're publishing by um, producing their own articles. Sometimes they're publishing by uh, circulating other people's articles. That's what a publisher does. So they should be treated as publishers. Now, the laws on free speech are different in the US than in Europe and, and elsewhere, um, but I think they should be treated as publishers. Secondly, I don't understand how it can be the case that you're not allowed to lie about medicine in advertising, but you are allowed to lie about politics. And how does that, how does that compute? And so I think there's a second um, aspect to this, which is the calling out of, um, uh, of lies. And linked to that is an issue that has been a big issue in your, um, is in your, um, in your elections, but it was also an issue in the UK Brexit referendum, which is how can it be right that um, accounts that are not people are out allowed to, to have thoughts? So the idea that you can lie and that you don't have to be a person to be a presence on social media, you can be a bot in other words, and that you can be a bot from another country that's an arrow at the heart of democratic politics. The third aspect of this is something that I'm way out of my um, te technical know-how, but there's a really interesting, I think, argument. <laughs> it's ironic given that I've mentioned him in respect to the end of history, but Francis Fukuyama has now written two articles in foreign affairs with a really penetrating intelligence. What he says is, look, the economic damage of anti-social media is much less than the political damage. And so we've got to get out of a mindset that says it's an economic lens that needs to be, you've got to judge by, it's a political lens. And then he pinpoints that it's the algorithms that decides what gets shared that is the critical political factor in the damage being done by social media. So his argument is you need to regulate the algorithms that's where the power lies and the destructive power lies. And so, uh, again, without pretending to be a, an expert on this, those are three areas where I think w w we need to save ourselves. Thanks. Uh, while we're on the subject of illiberal forces, uh, let me take the opportunity to take you back to Afghanistan. Uh, the subject of, the, of your address here the last time you were on campus. Um, I wonder, 
how you anticipate the situation to change for the general population there once the US and NATO forces are withdrawn? And, and specifically what you expect will be the greatest challenges uh, for humanitarian groups like the IRC in Afghanistan. And, and if you could say a few words about what the IRC is, is doing to prepare to meet these challenges. Yeah. Well, look, this is well-timed for reasons that I didn't um, know, didn't, didn't anticipate. Um, because yesterday morning I spent um, an hour with our team in Afghanistan. Now there are um, 1,100 International Rescue Committee employees in Afghanistan, and that creates two, two, two um, feelings for me. Um, one is pride in what they're doing. 1,194 of them, uh, ten, uh, sorry, 1,094 of them, in other words, all but six of them are Afghans, including Afghan women. 44% of our um, employees in Afghanistan are women. We work in nine provinces, uh, provinces that are controlled by the Taliban already, as well as provinces that are within the um, control of the uh, government. And I am incredibly proud of the extraordinary work that they are doing. Second feeling is, I, is fear. Um, fear not just about the future, but fear that should I say anything, uh, if I say anything in a public forum like this, I, don't, I, I have to be extremely careful not to say anything that will uh, prejudice the position or the work they are doing because they're working in, in, in an exceedingly dangerous um, environment. What, what, what we do know is that Afghanistan is one of the poorest countries in the world, that it has an enormously large internally displaced population, people who have been driven from there, who are internal refugees, if you like, as well as uh, refugees who are being returned from Pakistan, which is hosting two and a half million refugees from Afghanistan and from Iraq, Iran, which is hosting 800,000 uh, refugees. And um, I think that um, the, the fairest thing to say, that the most appropriate thing to say, is that um, I have very, very serious fear about what the future holds for the work that we're doing there, more particularly for the clients that we are serving. And we, we run education programs. We run, run programs for women's economic empowerment. Uh, we want, run programs for health and for child protection uh, by these Afghan, um, by our Afghan teams. And um, it's not a blanket um, question of whether or not um, uh, we're able to operate or not able to operate, because as I've uh, said, we're operating in areas that are already controlled by non-state forces. But the great fear is not just mine, the great fear is that the country descends back into civil war, which takes us right into the question that was at the heart of my talk today, which is what are the rights of civilians in war? And when you read about uh, Northern Alliance reforming in the north of the country, when you read about Hazara militias being formed in the west of the country, you, you fear that we're seeing, we've seen this movie before. And the movie was seen after the withdrawal of the Soviets in, in 1989, it took two or three years before things collapsed. Um, and that is the great fear. So um, our commitment there is very, very large. If anyone listening, watching this wants to see more about what we're doing, if they go to the IRC website, which is uh, www.rescue.org, you can click on Afghanistan and see our staff and actually I think some of our clients speaking about what they're doing. And it, it would be great to feel that some of the work that's going on there gets a broader audience as a result of this discussion, but there's undoubtedly a, a lot of tension about what's coming. Thanks. Let's, let me transition from the role of civil society and the, the pressures on civil society to, uh, to states, particularly um, great powers like the United States. And these are, this, this question is, is leveraged off of uh, comments from, from the audience. Um, who, there are members of the audience wanted to know how you would address comments made after the January 6th assaults uh, on the US Capitol that the US has to address democracy at home before it can promote it abroad. Uh, put differently from someone else was, does the fact that the United States is so embroiled in dealing with illiberal political forces nationally impede its ability to serve as a world leader 
against those forces internationally, in your view? Well, that is a great question. And usually, I've discovered in America, people often say that's a great question. And that often means that they don't know what the answer is. And so they just <laughs> to buy a bit of time for the uh, to advise. But actually, I, I, there is some, it's, a, it's both a great question and there's something I want to say about it. So uh, yes, I do think your, your ability, I'm, a, I'm not an American citizen, I'm a British citizen. Uh, you, America's ability uh, to be a force against impunity abroad is compromised by the weaknesses of your democracy at home. There's just no question about it. You just have to look at the uh, play that the Chinese and the Russians make of the um, uh, mistakes that are made in America to, uh, to, to see that the allegations of hypocrisy are thrown uh, far and wide, and sometimes they're thrown with good reason. So yes, it does impede. Secondly, do you have a job to do to strengthen your democracy at home? My goodness, yes, you do. I mean, the, um, uh, the, the assault on the, my mother-in-law, who I think is actually watching this, uh, um, watching this uh, talk, um, uh, texted me from um, uh, south of Los Angeles, where she lives, and um, on, the, on January the 6th, said, you'd better be watching this because it's, it's much more serious than, um, I don't get all of my political analysis from my mother-in-law, but in this case, it was very useful political uh, analysis. She was right, this wasn't just a riot. This was, a, this was much more serious, but of course it's the tip of the iceberg. There's a, there's a whole system of money and gerrymandering uh, and small c corruption that is part of the uh, weakening of American uh, democracy. So yes, it's serious, but here's the hard message that I want to give you. Two hard messages, actually. Hard message number one, there's no holiday from history. You can't spend the next 10 years fixing your own democracy and then think that the world's gonna be waiting for you to come along and make it better externally. So if you want to be a global power, which I think you need to be because the world is interconnected in your own interest, not just as a sort of vainglorious mission of values, but as a, a out of self-interest, I think you have to be engaged with the world. So hard message number one, there's no holiday from history. You have to do both. You have to be engaged internationally as well as domestically, but not least because they're connected. Um, but hard, hard message number two is, is almost even more uh, difficult uh, to pull off. Uh, you need to rally your friends and engender respect from your foes in the strategy that you pursue internationally if you are to secure your goals domestically. I mean, all you have to think is about the cyber war that was uh, launched on US democracy in 2016 to realize that the idea that you can nurture the fragile plant of American democracy at home by ignoring the rest of the world doesn't make sense. And that's why I think, that's why I think this point, I'm gonna write, try and write something for foreign affairs or something about this, that I think it's an accountability promotion campaign that you need rather than democracy promotion campaign. In the end, America is not going to decide whether Russia goes in a more democratic direction or not. It's not going to decide whether China goes in a more democratic direction or not. But America does have the power to engender respect for accountability from other powers around the world if you show you're serious. And that's the second hard message about why I think these issues are, are linked and how I would answer your, your very reason or the very reasonable question that comes from the audience. Great. Thank you so much, uh, David. Um, you've given us homework, as it turns out. You've come to MIT and you've given us homework, um, but it, very important homework for sure. And I want to thank you again for such a, a, a I, I call it bracing. I think I'm now I'm joining Dick and describing slightly depressing, but also I'm feeling energized, in fact. And I hope those in the audience feel you gave us some hard medicine, but you also gave us some things to think about. And one is, is kind of thinking about accountability, which I'm sure that's something our audience will, 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 will leave. So that's important. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Dick, for, for moderating it so, uh, so well and for giving our uh, speaker so many thoughtful uh, questions. In fact, an in, in audience as well uh, for providing such important questions. I want to thank Bob and um, Barrett uh, for, uh, Mew for making this uh, possible. Um, uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon for our next Mew Award. Um, and I want to thank our audience for being with us here today. We, we are uh, really delighted to, that you were here to join us for this uh, powerful lecture and um, for the presentation of the 2021 Mew Alumni Award. And as Dean of Shas, I hope we uh, here at MIT, we look forward to seeing you again soon.
Thank you and good afternoon.